5. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5 says this. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Amen. The war, the battlefield, as we've heard many times in the past, and I will reiterate again tonight, is in our minds. The war is for your minds, church. And whoever wins that war, whoever captures your imagination, whoever seizes hold of your mind has won. So we'll be preaching just for a few minutes. We all pray on this topic. The war for your mind. Amen. And I would ask uh, that as we're seated that we pray one last time. Ask the Lord to continue to have his way in the remainder of our service here tonight. God continues to work. He's not finished yet tonight. He still has a work to do. That his servant, that through his servant, through each and every one of you, his perfect will would be manifest in our presence here tonight. Lord Jesus, you're an awesome God. You continue to have free reign here in our service tonight. This is, in reality, your service. We are your people. This is your church. We acknowledge your absolute sovereignty in this and every area of our lives. You have free reign in our lives, thou most high God. We give you free reign in our service tonight, that you would speak that you would minister, that you would move according to your perfect will and according to the needs represented here tonight. Let your great name be magnified in our presence here tonight in these things we ask in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name we pray. Hallelujah, Jesus. Amen, amen. Thank you for standing. You can be seated. What you see before you tonight is not always the person that I was. I used to be, when I was growing up, a schemer, a conniver. And the difference between my brother and I was that he was always up front about everything. When he wanted to get me in trouble, he was very blunt and very direct and uh, not very effective because <laughs> I always saw it coming. But I was smarter. I knew which buttons to press. Brother Aaron knows what I'm talking about. And I would, I would get him riled up and I would get him off balance and then I could just I could just tweak it a little bit at the right time when one of our parents were present. And then he would be in trouble. And I would be innocent. I don't know what's going on. He just started doing this. He knew what I was doing. And I, I can't help but think now that I'm a parent that my parents probably suspected something too. But they couldn't prove it. <clears throat> so, so that was some of the things I used to do to my brother was, uh, well, let me tell you what I didn't do. <clears throat> let me tell you what I didn't do with my brother. <laughs> what I did not do, what, what didn't work or what I perceived wouldn't work was if I would have said something like, Mom, Dad, Scott ran down to the, the Army Reserve Station and stole a tank, and he's trying to drive it through the, the living room. Now, something like that, even as, as passionate and as earnest as I would have been, I doubt they'd have believed that. I don't think they would have bought it. But what I would say is I would think of something that he's been in trouble with already. And I'd say he's doing that. And 
they would believe that. They would believe that because there was some truth in it. He'd been convicted of those things before. So they had no trouble believing that he might do that again. So that's what I did. My lie was mixed with some truth. And that's important when you're telling a lie. Now one might be asking at this point, are you trying to teach us how to lie effectively? And the answer is no, I am not. That is good. I don't want you to lie at all. But there is one that will lie to you. And he is not going to be telling you about your brother or your sister stealing tanks from the Army Reserve Station and driving it through your living room. Because you know right away that that's stupid. That's not true. But your enemy is going to mix some truth in with his lie. That makes it a whole lot more palatable. I don't know if some of you may... Some of you probably do have a, a mice problem in your home. I do occasionally. I think we're, we're mice-free at the moment. But, uh, yeah, that'll change. <clears throat> It'll change. But uh, I used to use rat poison. And the mice, I think, have evolved since they made rat poison. It doesn't work much anymore. Uh, the last time I used rat poison, the, the mice built a nest in the little box of rat poison and slept there. <laughs> <coughs> so, yeah, this, this was decon. But, yeah, maybe, it's, maybe it was old. I don't know. But it, it's interesting. The ingredients of rat poison are, uh, there's not a lot of poison in there. I looked up decon, the, the amount of poison is 0.0025%. That means that rat poison is 99.9975% good food. It's good food, at least for the rat. But it's that 0.0025% that'll kill you. Just a little bit, that's all it needs. The enemy of our soul, in, our, in the battle for our minds, will do exactly that. He will send just a little bit of poison. You may not be able to detect it. You may not be able to see it. He will come at you with good food, good scriptures. Isn't that what he did with Jesus? He quoted scripture, right? Misquoted scripture, but it was scripture. He wasn't telling him anything way out in left field. He was quoting good scripture to Jesus. The problem we have is twofold as Christians, as, as a people of God. The first problem is we don't know what the Word of God says. That's a problem for obvious reasons. If we don't know what the Word of God says, how are we going to know if he's quoting it correctly? How are we going to know if, if what he is saying, if what anyone is saying, is true or not? Now, as Christians... We need to understand, we need to settle in our hearts that the word of God is truth. That is a, when we settle absolute truth in our minds, when we determine for ourselves what is true and what is not, what we are using is our foundational preconceptions. 
our foundational presuppositions of what is right and what is wrong, what is true and what is not true. For example, I know of people, when they read the Word of God, they don't come to the Word of God with the idea of, what is the Lord trying to tell me? They come to the Word of God with this concept. I'm going to read this, and I'm going to determine whether or not this is true, whether or not this is valid. They are judging the word of God on some higher authority, perceived higher authority. Okay, understand what I say. People have higher authorities than the word of God. There is no higher authority than the word of God, period. Okay? Uh, but... When you're speaking with individuals, they may or may not recognize the Bible as that higher authority. So when they read scripture, when you try to teach them a Bible study, they are going to be judging and evaluating those scriptures based on something else. I've used this analogy before. Uh, why do you believe this? Because this is true. Okay, why do you believe this? Because this is true. Why do you believe this? Because this is true. And on and on and on down the line until eventually, well, why do you believe this? Because it just is. This is your foundational source of truth. This is what you are going to judge and evaluate all truth statements by. As Christians... This, for us, needs to be the Word of God. It needs to be the Word of God. One reason that we stumble, one reason Satan is able to enter into our minds is because we don't know it. The second reason is, is because we do not accept it as truth. We may know it. We may say it's, it's true, it's good, it's, it's right. As far as it goes, but again, at the end of the day, how are we living? How are we walking? Do we take it that seriously in our lives? I don't want to see a show of hands, but how many people are on track with their Bible reading? How many people do read scripture regularly? If you do, you probably actually believe what I'm saying. If you do not, well, you can evaluate that based on whatever truth you hold to be true. <clears throat> but I would submit to you this evening that it is not the Bible. As Christians, it has to be the word of God. The remainder of my message tonight, I pray, will demonstrate to you why that is. Luke 6, verses 45 and 46 says this. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, bringeth forth that which is evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaketh. Out of the abundance of his heart. Now, Proverbs 23 and 7 says, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Our thought life then becomes very important, doesn't it? The things that we think about, the, the thoughts that are generated, they end up becoming our actions. And through our actions, they end up becoming who we are. It all starts with our thought. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Our thoughts become very important. We didn't read verse 46 of Luke chapter 6. That says, And why call ye me Lord, Lord? And do not the things which I say. It's interesting that he would begin with our thought life. 
and end up with our actions. Why do you call me Lord and don't do the things that I say? The importance of our thought life, the correctness of our thought life will be determined by our submission in the realm of thought to Christ. We hear lately, and I think rightly so, a lot about submission to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That is foundational. If you are not submitted in every area of your life, you will, you will struggle and you will fight. <clears throat> Those going through the Wednesday classes, the, the undercover, uh, you're going to hear bits and pieces of that in this message. Uh, you're welcome for the reiteration. <coughs> uh, otherwise, uh, it's all good stuff. The author of that book says one thing that I had actually forgotten about. I think I wrote it down last time I went through it, but, but it is a very powerful statement that there is no good thing outside of God's will. There is no good thing outside of the will of God. <clears throat> and that is something that I have needed to beat into myself, pray and fast into myself, because it always looks so good out there. It always looks so like people are really enjoying themselves. Like, you guys know what I'm saying. In moments of weakness, not when I'm strong, not when I'm spiritually strong. I, I see right through it then. But in moments of weakness, it gets real easy for me to, to, to look at, at someone out in the world who's financially prosperous, and they look like they're going somewhere, and they have purpose, and, and they're doing things. And I'm like, man. David felt the same way in a moment of weakness. Some of you have felt the same way in moments of weakness. But there is no good thing outside of the will of God. And that is something that we have to settle in our hearts. That when it comes to every area of our life, tonight we're talking about our thought life. But every area of our lives needs to be submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We have to recognize him as Lord and as God in every area of our lives. When he tells us to do something, we don't question it. We don't question him. We don't question his motives. We don't ask why me and not that guy or if something bad. If something good, oh, well, yeah. Yeah, well, thank you. Yes, finally. I get what I deserve. That's, what do we really deserve, church? Have you ever stopped to think about that for a moment? I try to, in my moments of weakness, think about what I deserve. What do I really deserve? What have I earned? The answer isn't a good one. It's not a good one. Yeah. Our thoughts will always translate into actions. Our imaginations, our thoughts, our logic, our reason will always be at war with God. They must be purposefully and consistently wrestled down and chained. Our thought life has to be Bring, be brought into obedience and subjection to Christ. Just like every other area of our lives. But our thoughts, see our thoughts get us in trouble. Why? Because no one else knows what I'm thinking. If you read Matthew chapters 5 through 7, Jesus is always, 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 I can't remember how many times, 13 times, 16 times, something like that, he makes a clear distinction between Old Testament law and New Covenant realities. In the Old Testament law, ye have heard that it was said of old time, 
uh, you, shall not, you shall not murder your brother. But I say unto you that if you hate your brother, you've already murdered him. He always brings it back to the heart, to the thoughts, to motives. And that is so vital for us to understand. Everything starts with that. In the New Testament church, everything starts with our thoughts. Everything. For good or for bad, everything starts with our thoughts. And if we don't have that nailed down, if we don't have it secured, then Satan is going to come in somehow, some way, and he's going to wrest that from us. And you're not even going to know it. You will be cast into a place of deception, and you won't even know it. That's what deception is. You don't know it. You don't realize it. So what are we to think? How are we to think as Christians so as to give glory to God? How are we to order our thoughts so that we don't fall into deception? So that we, we are subjected in our thought life to the obedience of Christ. 1 Peter 3.15 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. I've done detailed exegesis on that in, in sermons past, uh, but tonight I want to focus on the very first part, sanctifying the Lord God in our hearts. What that means is we need to set Jesus Christ apart as Lord in our hearts. First and foremost, before we can know anything for sure, before we can have any answers of any kind, we have to settle in our hearts that Jesus Christ is Lord. We have to sanctify him in our hearts. We need to set him apart as Lord and God in our hearts. And we need to walk that way and live that way and think that way. Only then do we have any hope of answers of any kind. Only then do we have any knowledge, any possibility of knowledge of any kind. If we haven't done that, church, we will, be, we will slip quickly into error. And we'll never know it. We can't know it. We cannot know it because we have not set him apart as Lord in our hearts. We have not given him lordship. In theological circles, it's called epistemological lordship. <clears throat> Epistemology is the theory of knowledge. How do you know what you know? <clears throat> He has to have lordship over our thoughts. Well, does that mean everything? Does that mean all knowledge? I can't know anything? Yeah, that's exactly what that means. If Jesus Christ is, if the biblical God as revealed to us in scripture is not true, if he is not who he says he is, if he doesn't exist, then knowledge becomes impossible. Again, I don't have time to demonstrate that tonight. I've done it in other lessons. If you have questions, uh, you can certainly talk to me. Um, the biblical Christian worldview is the only rational, cogent worldview that there is. Every other worldview, Islam, Muslim, Jehovah's Witness, any non-biblical Christian worldview, Atheism, secular humanism, it leads to absurdity. It leads to the revelation that knowledge is impossible. Why? Because they are all self-contradictory at some point. They all contradict themselves in some manner. They are logically inconsistent. They lead to absurdity. So this is the only way. This is the only way. There is no room in the mind of a Christian for intellectual neutrality. Now, what do I mean by that? The idea that we can all start from a neutral, equal place intellectually, and then from there, using autonomous reason, determine whether or not Christ is actually Lord. 
From there, we determine whether or not the Bible is actually God's infallible word. There are people that, that start this way. They go through a reason process. They go through logical process, and they, they evaluate scripture, and they, they go through history and archaeology, and then eventually they come up with a conclusion that, yes, the Bible is worthy of, of believing in. Yes, God is worthy of serving, and then they, they, they end up there. They end up there, but the Bible teaches us we have to start there. If we don't start there, then again, the Bible is not our absolute source of truth. It's not our foundational reality. It is not our ultimate authority. Something else is. And that's what they're using to evaluate Scripture, evaluate the validity of Christ's claims. Intellectual neutrality is not giving God lordship of your mind. If we, if we exist this way, it will rob you of truth. There was a quote in, in a Dictionary of Theological Terms about the truth of God. It's a little verbose, but it, uh, it's good. It says this, The truth of God in its widest sense is a perfection which qualifies all his intellectual and moral attributes. His knowledge is infinitely true in relation to its objects, and his wisdom unbiased either by prejudice or passion. His justice and his goodness and all their exercises are infinitely true to the perfect standard of his own nature. In all outward manifestations of his perfections to his creatures, God is always true to his nature, always self-consistently divine. This attribute, in its more special sense, qualifies all God's intercourse with his rational creatures. He is true to us as well as to himself, and thus has laid the foundation of all faith and therefore of all knowledge. It is the foundation of all confidence, first in our senses, second in our intellect and conscience, third in any authenticated supernatural revelation. The two forms in which this perfection is exercised in relation to us are first, his entire truthfulness in all his communications, second, his perfect sincerity in undertaking and faithfulness in discharging all his engagements. If I may sum that up. Because he is who he says he is, we are able to possess knowledge. All knowledge begins and ends with God. There are no truths outside of God. God is said to have creative knowledge. What does that mean? God's creative knowledge means this. When God claims to know something, it's not because he went to an area of the universe and examined it and picked it apart and reverse engineered it and discovered something and, oh, now he knows this. He has creative knowledge. He knew something before it existed, and his knowledge, physical reality, simply caught up with that. He reshaped reality according to his knowledge. That's creative knowledge. That's something you and I do not possess. <laughs> we will never possess that. So don't start missing it. Don't start longing for it. You'll never have it. <clears throat> we do have creative capacity, but not ex nihilo, not out of nothing. We need stuff to make stuff. But that's God's creative knowledge. Now from that, he reveals things to his creation. He reveals knowledge to his people. He does that through general revelation, through creation, and he does that through specific revelation, through his word. Now I'm talking about the lordship of Christ here. When we submit ourselves to God in our thoughts, we are able to possess the knowledge he possesses. Let me say that again. 
and they'll qualify it. When we submit to the Lordship of Christ in our thoughts, we are able to possess the knowledge he possesses. Because he's revealed these things to us. Now, does that mean we're going to know everything he does? No, of course not. That's not what that means. But we have to start there if we are to know anything. Proverbs 1, 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. It's the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. That's where everyone has to start if they are to know anything true. If they are to know anything true. Now, atheists know all kinds of things. Some of them are true. They know a lot about science. Some of them are whacked. And that's because they slip off into uh, mental oblivion. They slip off into deception. And it's easy to deceive someone like that because they have no knowledge of truth. John 17, 17 says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So we have to start with God and the truths of his word if we are to know anything. To truly start with God, we must submit to his lordship in the realm of thought. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. We have to reverence and give respect unto him in the realm of thought if we are to know anything. When we talk about submission to God, I'm going to uh, pick up my anchor here and uh, loose myself from my notes for a bit. God help us all. <clears throat> when we talk about submission, that is a rough topic to talk about. And I, under, I understand that. I understand the typical American attitude toward submit, toward obey, toward comply. Most people, when they hear that word, it rubs their rhubarb a little bit. The bristles stand up on the back of their neck. They get a little irritated, a little angry, a little upset. And it takes a lot of teaching and a lot of prayer and a lot of experience with God to begin to understand why it's important, why I have to submit, why it's good for me to submit. And then the This work? Sweet. I think Jeff is going to ride this one for another few weeks. <laughs> oh, it's Brother Andy. All right. <clears throat> it takes God a long time to bring us to the place where he can really start teaching us about spiritual authority. I would to God that we could accelerate that a bit tonight, and here's why. Not, not just because it's a good topic. It is a good topic. It's a great topic. Filled with enormous spiritual fruit. But see, the thing is, church, Jesus is coming back. And there's... I like... I like doing research and, and diving down deep, staying down long, coming up dry. 
I love that. I love searching out the, the original Greek and Hebrew and what does this commentary say and this dictionary and what does this church father have to say about that? I love doing all of that. <clears throat> but at the end of the day, what really matters is what can we apply in our, in our regular lives? What can we use? What can we... What can we take from scripture and begin to apply in my life, in someone else's life? How can I use this knowledge to better someone else? How can I use this knowledge to bring someone from a non-Christian to a Christian? From a new Christian to an adult Christian? From, a, from somebody who has no interest in ministry to someone who now wants to minister the gospel of Jesus Christ to someone? How do I advance the kingdom of God with this? How do I draw closer to God with this? Not in some ethereal, mystical sense, but in a practical sense. How do I conform closer to the image of Christ? Those are the things that I'm really after. Because when I, when I get up to heaven... To be perfectly honest, I don't think it's really going to matter to God how many commentaries I read or how many Bible dictionaries I have in my, my digital library. <clears throat> I like them. I like reading them. But I don't think it's really going to matter except for what I was able to pull out and use. What did I use? And God is not going to give us anything if we're not going to use it. You've heard of the use it or lose it? If God gives us something, he wants us to use it. He wants us to use it for him. He wants us to use it for his glory. And if we don't, if we just sit back and suck up all the blessings and all the, oh, look at how smart I am now. I can explain this in the original Hebrew which would be really cool if I could do that. <clears throat> but it, it's meaningless if I can't do something with it. What is the practical application of these things? More and more, that's what I'm after. More and more, that's what I really want. The practical application to these things. How can I use this to advance the kingdom of God? How can I use this in ministry? How can I use it in my family? I don't need to sound smart. Maybe 20 years ago that was that was a cool thing for me. But it doesn't pay the bills. It doesn't do anything practical. I want something practical. I want something usable. And 99 times out of 100, those are, those are the simple things. Those are the easy things. Those are the, the basic foundational things. And one of those basic foundational things tonight, church, is spiritual authority. Spiritual authority. And I know it's... I know you guys love hearing about that. I get it. I get it. It's, it's great to hear... How that we have to submit to God and do what he says no matter what. But it's a practical thing. And if we start applying it, not just in our thought life, but every area of our lives. Every area of our lives. Most people, even most Christians, most seasoned Christians, their attitude toward authority is, well, if... If that's what God wants, if, you know, I'm going to pray about it and I'm going to seek God. And if, if God wants me to submit to this person, well, okay, God help me to do this. But the attitude that he wants us to have is we, we should be going around looking for people to submit to. That should be our default state. Who can I submit to? What did Jesus say? If you're going to be great, let him be their minister. What does minister mean? 
It doesn't mean the cool guy behind the pulpit. It doesn't mean the guy in charge, the guy with the authority. It means the minister, the servant, the slave, the guy that gets up in the middle of the night and prays for someone. He doesn't even know who he's praying for, but God laid it on his heart. He, he stays up late at night, or she stays up late at night because God laid someone on their heart. So they're going to sit up and they're going to pray. Even though they have to get up at 5 in the morning, they're going to give their time in prayer because God asked it of them. Church, do you see what I'm saying? We've got to bring ourselves in line with, with where God is going. We can't, we can't start thinking within ourselves that we know the direction he's going to take. We can't start thinking within ourselves that all knowledge is in here. God speaks with me too. That is not the case. Yes, he speaks to his people. But he has placed men and women in our lives that we need to submit to. He has placed authorities in our lives that we need to give ourselves to. And we can't start thinking, well, you know, if it's God's will, he'll, he'll confirm that to me. He'll, he'll, he'll let me know, two or three witnesses, and these kinds of things. No, our default state ought to be, well, I'm just going to submit to him, and if that's wrong, God can show me later. But our default state needs to be submission to the will of God. Yeah. Submission to God, because that is our protection That is our protection. We need to be protected. We need to be in line with the will of God. If we are to be the people of God, if we are to be used in any capacity, in any way, shape, or form, we've got to, we've got to learn to obey his voice. We've got to learn to, to hear him and to give ourselves to him. It's not a bad thing. It is the best thing for us. It is the very best thing for us. If we would just learn to submit to God. If we would just learn, if we, would, if we could get to the place in our heart of hearts that we begin to realize that authority is good for us. And you're going to have a measure of authority too. No one is an authority unto themselves. There is no one alive that does not submit to someone. Everybody, everybody submits to someone. That's the way God orchestrated it. Everybody gets a protection. Everybody gets a covering for their lives. You will never get to the place where you step outside of that. And thank God. Okay, we're back. Colossians chapter 2, verses 3 through 8 says this, In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge? How about the War of 1812? Is that part of all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge? How about the chemical composition of water? Do I need to, do, do I need to wax spiritual to, to understand chemistry? How about the literature of Shakespeare? How about the laws of logic? And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. How did you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, church? Did you receive it after a series of lessons on the, the historical Jesus? Did you, re, did you receive archaeological evidence as to the authenticity of Scripture? And then you received Christ Jesus the Lord? Or did you receive him in faith? I received him in faith. I didn't know a whole lot about scripture. 
I didn't know a whole lot about God. I had a powerful experience. That's what I remember. I remember the guy who preached the message. I don't remember one single word he said. Not one word. I don't remember the scripture reference. I don't remember any of it. I remember the worship service a little bit. It was interesting. Very interesting. I just sat back and observed. But I remember when he was done talking and he started calling people up to the altar, I couldn't get there fast enough. I didn't know I had done so many wrong things. I didn't know what a bad guy I was until then. But it wasn't after a study of the historical Jesus, I tell you that. I received Christ Jesus the Lord in faith. The Bible says in verse 6, so walk ye in him. If we received him in faith, we've got to walk in faith. Faith in what? Faith in Jesus. Faith in his word. Getting back to our original premise. That has got to be our starting point. The Lord Jesus Christ. How he's revealed to us in his, how he has revealed himself to us in his word. That has got to be our starting point. Rooted, verse 7, rooted and built up with him and established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Now is Paul warning us against philosophy? Some philosophy, absolutely. A specific kind of philosophy, though. Did you know philosophy means love of wisdom? Philio, Sophie. Sophist. Love of wisdom. <clears throat> if you read the book of Proverbs, Proverbs exhorts us to love wisdom, doesn't it? But not just any wisdom, church. It is very particular what kind of wisdom we are to fall in love with. The wisdom that comes from above. The wisdom that comes from Jesus Christ. Not after the tradition of men. Not after the rudiments of the world. God's word demands unreserved allegiance to God and his truth in all our thought and scholarly endeavors. Whether it be about the war of 1812 chemical composition of water, the literature of Shakespeare, the laws of logic, or even biblical truths. We have to be presuppositionally committed to Christ in the world of thought and not neutral and firmly tied down to the faith which we have been taught or else the persuasive argumentation of secular thought will delude us. Hence, the Christian is obligated to presuppose the word of God in every area of knowledge. The alternative is delusion. Again, we have to settle in our hearts. There is no neutral ground, church. Not in the world of thought. There are no neutral stances to take. If anybody asks you to do that, they are trying to delude you. They are trying to separate you from Christ. They are trying to remove the spiritual distinction that separates you from all the other vain philosophies in the world. Hold fast to it. Don't let it go. Don't let these precious truths go. Romans 1, 21 and 22 says, Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Now, the Lord is not engaging in name-calling here. 
By fool, he means someone who has not accepted the lordship of Christ. Someone who does not acknowledge God as Lord. Someone who has a higher standard of truth, of authority. The Bible calls them fools. This verse teaches a very interesting fact. And that is this. That all men and women everywhere who have ever lived understand that there is a God. Believe it or not, if you believe scripture, if you believe the Bible is the word of God, the God that wrote the Bible, the God that created all men and women everywhere, said this about his creation. They all understand that I exist. When God creates someone, he places that knowledge in them. It is evident from creation that there is a God. Now, people work very hard to suppress that knowledge. They work very hard to convince themselves there is no God. Or at least a God that we can manage. But this God is unacceptable. This God demands too much. This God demands everything from me. He demands my allegiance. He demands my complete commitment to him in every area of my life. Is that really that much to ask? I'll move on from that point, but just think about that in, in a free moment or two. <laughs> what uh, what big things are we giving up when we serve God? What great lofty goals and dreams are, are we forfeiting when we choose to serve the Lord Jesus Christ? I had plans, to, I had goals just like everyone else. Maybe they would have come to fruition. Maybe they wouldn't. Who knows? I'll never know now. Too bad, so sad. What I do know is this. When I die and I stand before my creator, what I am not going to be wondering is how my life would have been without God. That is not what's going to be going through my mind. I am not going to be wondering... All that stuff I gave up for you. All that stuff I sacrificed. Everything I missed out on. None of that's going to be going through any of our minds. We are going to be so thankful that it cost us so little to receive so much. Living for eternity is part of our thought process. We can direct our thoughts toward the storms around us, or we can direct our thoughts to the Lord Jesus Christ in the midst of the storm. We can direct our thoughts to heaven, to our reward. That's what Paul did. These light things which are but for a moment worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight in glory. Paul at this point, of course, was quite daft, wasn't he? Quite insane, because those were not light things, and they weren't but for a moment. Yeah, they were. Our thoughts matter. And if we would submit them to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, if we would start ordering our thoughts according to Scripture, thoughts that glorify Him, thoughts that advance us toward Him, 
instead of holding bitterness and, and, and jealousy and, and hatred in our hearts. If we could let that stuff go and have an attitude of forgiveness and mercy and love and compassion, do you have any idea what God has forgiven you of? Do you have any idea of how many times he's been merciful and gracious to us? How in the name of God can we hold anything against anyone else? How can we? When we do not give God lordship of our thoughts, then our thought processes are polluted and corrupted. We talked about this on Wednesday. By emotion, by false preconceptions, by false ideas and knowledge, things that we think we know, but we know erroneously. In the beginning, it wasn't so. In the beginning, Adam and Eve thought just like God thinks. Did you know the laws of logic come from the character of God? You know that, right? The laws of logic that we have, codified and written down nice and neat, all of the fallacies, the formal and the informal, all of that is ultimately expression of how God thinks naturally. He naturally thinks perfectly logically. The reason we have a problem with it is because we don't. We don't. And we need those things codified and written down and courses taught in our colleges and universities. Everybody ought to know the laws of logic. Everybody ought to know logical argumentation. It's, it's a good thing to know. And I don't say that, again, to sound really smart. I say that because I want to think the way he thinks. I do. Because I want to be like he is. I see myself in the word of God. I see the reflection that it gives me. And all I can think of is my God. Is this all the farther I've gotten? Twenty-five some odd years of serving you, and this is it. Still way up there, and I'm still way down here. But the way God thinks naturally. It's not the way we think anymore. It used to be, but it's not now. Part of giving him lordship in our thoughts is beginning to think again like he thinks. Rationally. Not emotionally. See, what emotion does is it twists everything around. When something's coming against us, when someone has unforgiveness against us or is judging us, we think, oh, they're judging me. They should be merciful to me. I need mercy. But now when someone else has wronged us, now we get righteous indignation, don't we? Now we are justly angry at them. And God, get them. Show them what they did is wrong. Now, is that logically consistent, or is that a little bit hypocritical? It is, but we're all guilty of it, all of us. Why is that? Because we don't think like God thinks. If we did, the emotion would be removed, and we'd just see it from a scriptural standpoint. 
because that is our source of truth, yes? Not our emotions, not what we think we know or have heard told from someone else, but what thus saith the Lord. That's what our source of truth is. That's how we ought to order our thoughts by. Anyway. All right, it's up there. <laughs> okay. Um, so they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. They became vain in their imaginations. Once you separate God from your thought processes, you've cut the anchor. You're adrift on a, on a stormy sea now. And the Lord himself only knows where you're going to end up. You're going, to, you're going to go through all kinds of delusion, all kinds of error, because you've separated yourself from truth. And you are going to force, you are going to force in your mind the idea that God does not exist. You can't, ra you can't explain it logically because it's not true. You can't prove God does not exist because he does exist. You can't prove a negative anyway. Logical fallacy. But you cannot, you cannot demonstrate the non-existence. Uh, anyway. <clears throat> you cannot show that God does not exist because he does. You cannot rationalize in your mind any other worldview logically and consistently because every other worldview presupposes the non-existence of God in some way, shape, or form. And that is not true. When you base yourself on a lie, you base your entire way of thinking on a lie, you're deluded. You are deluded. Intellectual neutrality, not giving God lordship of your mind, robs you of truth. It is also sin. Ephesians 4, 17, 18 says, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. You've got to make a choice. At some point, you've got to make a choice. We're going to be set apart by the truth of God or we, we are going to be alienated from the life of God. That is the choice that every believer, every non-believer has to make at some point. We all start with the knowledge of God. It's, it's basic. I mean, it's not as revealed in Scripture. Okay? But we all understand from birth. It's been placed in us by our Creator. Just like our desire to worship is placed in us by our Creator. Most people worship false idols, but everybody worships. Everybody worships something, someone. Just like that is placed in all people, the knowledge of God is placed in every person. That there is a God. And at some point, you're going to have to make a choice about that. Suppress it, cast it off. And hold to something else or give in to that. Pursue it. You can't have both. Either you will be set apart, set against, or alienated from the world or from the word of God. It's all or nothing. You can't play it both ways. You can't stay on the fence. You just can't. You can try. Maybe some of you have tried it. Maybe a few of you are right now. A little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of world, a little bit of church. But that doesn't last. It's too hard. You're going to fall one way or the other. You will. That's not prophecy. That's just good old common sense. That's the word of God. You will fall one way or the other. It's going to be at some point in your life, all or nothing. You will move all the way this way or all the way that way. The Bible 
calls the, the fence riding lukewarmness. And we know how God feels about lukewarm people. He wants them either hot or cold. He would rather they were hot or cold. But lukewarm disgusts him. It disgusts God. Colossians 1.21 says, And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. We are either going to bring every thought to the obedience of Christ, or we will continue as alienated and enemies of God in our minds. It starts in our minds. It starts in our minds. The importance of our thought life cannot be overemphasized. These are practical things that, that we're trying to relate tonight. Practical things that we can take and run with. This isn't deep, esoteric, spiritual knowledge. Okay, these are very basic principles. And I'm not, I'm not saying that because I think you're stupid. I think quite the opposite. I'm saying that because these practical things that we're giving you tonight can be used starting tonight. And they can be understood by our children. They can be understood by your neighbor, by your coworker, your family member. These aren't things that you have to live for God for 50 years to begin to implement. Sometimes it takes that. But it doesn't have to. It ought not to. It ought not. There are so many things. There are so many so many desires in the heart of God for his people. The yearning that he has for each and every one of you. To be intimate with you. To have a relationship with you. To not fight with you all the time. And me. To not fight with us all the time over this or that or the other. If you're a parent, Fighting with your kids is, good grief is that hard work. Oh, my word. They just don't relent. They don't give up. You try to reason with them. You try to love on them. You give them an inch, they take a mile. Elena? You got to do that to me, honey. <laughs> we ought not be fighting with God. God tells us to do something. Understand, it's for our best. We can trust God when he tells us to do something. And submission comes from trust. And trust comes from relationship. If we don't have a relationship with God, we're never going to trust him. We've got to have a relationship with God. If we don't, we're never going to trust him, and we're never going to be able to do what he says. Because we're always going to be second-guessing. We're always going to be doubting in our hearts and in our minds. Why is he telling me that and not him? Why am I having to do this and not someone else? Or another possibility is, well, I tried trusting him, and he didn't come through for me, so I cannot trust him again. God let me down. He failed me. Did he? I preached last week about the twisty, turny, weird crazy paths that God takes us through to get to his will. 
It will never be the direct, easy path, the one that you're wanting. The answer that you're looking for, that's the direct, easy path. But God has something better. He has something greater in store for you. And it won't be accomplished by the, the Tonka toy kindergarten easy peasy path. I could have said that better. I'll work on it. <clears throat> it worked. The path that God chooses for us is everything that you need. It's everything that we need to get to where he's trying to take us. We've got to trust him. We've just got to get to the place where we trust him. When he says something in the word of God, we trust him. We're not, we're not looking at it saying, well, what did he really mean by that? Obviously, he didn't mean that because it didn't work for me. Well, would you give him a chance? I mean, I know he's God, but, uh, and he could do anything he wants as quick as he wants, but <laughs> he's God, you're not. <clears throat> Why don't we just let him be in charge for a while? Why don't we let him do it his way? Would that be all right? Because when we let him do it his way, things just, they work out. They really do work out. But when we try to keep forcing our will on God, when we keep trying to force events and circumstances to conform to our ideas of how things ought to be, where things ought to go, you might get there, but you're going to be in rough shape. You are going to be in rough shape when you get there. It's all or nothing. James 4 and 4 says this, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Now we are friends with people in the world. Absolutely. What the scripture is exhorting here tonight is that we cannot befriend the systems of the world, the philosophies of the world, the way the world does things, the way the world thinks, its preconceptions. When we came to God, the Bible says we are a new creature, old things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. That includes our thought processes, that includes our preconceived ideas and our presuppositions. They all become new. They all become regenerated and in line with the will of God. We don't think the way we used to think anymore. We start thinking the way God thinks. We start seeing the way he sees. We start loving what he loves, hating what he hates. Amen. <clears throat> Let's all stand. And if you could come forward at this time, please come to the altar. There is most certainly a war raging. There's a war raging tonight. As bad as my vision is, I could see it in some of you. Distractions. Things flitting about just in the inner recesses of our mind. There is a war to win. And it will not be won by compromise. It will not be won by striking a bargain or a deal. 
It will be won by completely selling out. By completely giving ourselves over to the will of God. I wish I were more eloquent tonight and were able to more properly express the designs that God has for you, for our families, for our church body. The things God would do through us. The areas that he would use us in. If we would just learn to give God lordship. Those designs are still in his mind. Those plans are still there, waiting on us, waiting on you, waiting on me. Never doubt. Never doubt for one second just how unique and how special and how powerful you are. You each of you are so absolutely vital to the work of God. But the enemy comes and he lies to you, he lies to me, and he tells us things like, you're not being effective, you're not doing much. Just worry about your job. Let someone else worry about church. That's what they get paid for. Any, any number of things can come into our minds. They're never good. They're never wholesome. They're never righteous. They're never right. They're never from God. If it were God speaking... He would, be see, he, he would say something else entirely. I created you with purpose. I created you with meaning. I had you in mind when I was on the cross. I saw your face when I was dying. church, he means, you mean so much to him. You mean everything to him. And our attitude toward our Savior is something less. It's something less than that. The weakness of our minds, the weakness of our flesh gets in the way of where we want to be with God. As we enter into a place of prayer tonight, Let's just enter into a place of God, to, uh, a place of prayer tonight. Can we kneel before God? Can we find a place and can we kneel before Him tonight? There are ministries in our church that are waiting to be filled by.